Hey, welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press, our segment where we'll take a look at the big stories in our national dailies. Um, let's now welcome our analysts for today, Mr. Tunde Kolawali. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Hope you had a great weekend. Yes, we did. Thank you. Okay. Beginning with the Punch newspaper, 17 southern governors discuss Buhari's land recovery order for herders. Southern governors worried about grazing roots recovery order suspect hidden agenda. State helmsmen deliberate on Malami's pronouncement activities in Lagos meeting today. Senate summons ex-NSITF bosses over alleged 84 billion naira embezzlement. MCDN decides 70 medical practitioners' cases August over alleged negligence. Also on the Perch newspaper, only 88,950 out of 3.4 million hectares irrigated agric output suffers. Petroleum industry bill, Dangote refinery, others to buy crude in Naira. Sim Nin, telcos lose 20.83 million subscribers, 29.58 billion Naira in revenue. Youth arrested in Abuja church over Buhari Musgo's shirt and slogans. Also on the Punch newspaper, we see a picture here of a bad road and the caption reads, Agbado Kiaro Road in Agbado Ifo local government area of Shun State, Ogun State on Sunday. Also on the Punch newspaper, Kwara Assembly attacks Lai Mohammed, faction reports minister to the National Working Committee. Brazil based Nigerian held with 100 wraps of cocaine in private parts and in bag. Tears as tanker kills four traders in Oyo market. And lastly on the Punch, Yoruba Nation rally, police killed my daughter. I want justice, sales, says sales girl's mother. All right, moving on to the nation newspapers. Uh, let's see what we can also find here. It says, uh, the big one, Senate panel, okay, is cabinet formation within 30 days. Also on the nation newspapers this morning, truck kills five in Ibadan market. Lai Mohammed didn't sponsor us, a choir, choir house uh, members. And um, also the nation... Um, Newspapers this morning, Yishao and 10 others listed for Nigeria uh, Prize for Literature. Police arrest 49 Yoruba nation agitators with charms and guns. No law against carrying charms. That's on the nation this morning. Still, Naira devaluation will push petrol subsidy to 7.1 billion Naira per day. Uh, Niger Delta stakeholders, PIB provisions not far-reaching. And um, finally, EFCC grills or your assembly uh, officials over 1 billion Naira vehicle contracts. Those are the big ones on the nation newspapers this morning. Um, turning now to the next newspaper, The Guardian. Debt service burden. Subsidy may push deficit above 7 trillion Naira this year. Deficit already 3 trillion Naira at the end of May. Debt service ratio hits 97%. Past PIB scandalous, Niger Delta Group declares. Bandits kill seven, kidnap seven in Kaduna. Kanu didn't authorize ritual killings, says IPOB. Police parade 49 Yoruba nation agitators in Lagos. Third wave scare, Lagos inspects synagogue ahead of Joshua's burial. Deadly Delta variants already in 96 countries, says WHO. Nigeria records 71 new cases, Lagos with 63. Fears over misappropriation of 80 billion naira released for local manufacture of vaccines. All right, and now on the daily independent newspapers. Banks' aggressive digital drive may spur massive job cuts. Also, aviation stakeholders worried as uh, ground handling rates drops to $400. Seraps use Buhari over 25 billion naira overdrafts taken uh, 25 billion dollars overdrafts taken from CBN. Police parade 49 suspects for holding Yoruba Nation rally in Lagos. Display charms and ammunition recovered. Also defections. PDP governors take over Ondo gubernatorial Supreme Court battle. Bandits abduct babies, nurses, security guards in Zaria Hospital. That's shocking. 
and moves on the way to suspend Lai Mohammed over factional APC secretariat. Reps in Kwara Speaker disown minister over claim on campaign funding. Finally, NCC exceeds revenue target, post 150 billion naira spectrum fee in five months. Good morning once again, Mr. Kola Wale. Thanks for joining us. Good morning us. to you, my brother. All right, let, let's start with the Yoruba Nation agitate, agitators. Uh, the news says 49 of them were arrested with charms and, you know, some say also ammunition. Quickly react to the response of the Lagos State Government to the rally and uh, the arrest of these 49. Well, uh, the response of the police to the rally and that of the Lagos State Government, in my humble opinion, are uh, irresponsible and uh, clearly against the intendment letters and uh, all that the Nigerian Constitution stands uh, for. They are a plethora of authorities with regard to the people's right to demonstrate. You and I will remember the Inspector General of Police and the MPP's case and uh, the constitutional provisions under the fundamental human rights. A freedom of association, freedom to protest and uh, war abuse. One of the tenets of democracy is that um, when people are uh, gripped with uh, government programs, policies, and actions, is it that they go to court to ventilate their grievances? Or they will approach the National Assembly to reverse some of those policies they don't like? Or they go into lobbying and mediation, uh, lobbying, mediation, conciliations, and what have you uh, with the government. So if this be the case, uh, and you don't expect people to begin to take losses to their hands or engage in self help then you must allow people to freely exercise their right to protest and hold uh, demonstrations. And we must remember that the people in government today use the tools of demonstrations and protests a great deal for them to be able to get to power and get Nigerian people to vote out um, their predecessor uh, government. So everything that they have promised us, everything that they have stood for, everything that the Constitution guarantees us, everything that the law has given to the Nigerian people, the people in government to the President Muhammad Buhari and the APC are taking it away from us. It's like uh, we are returning to 1983-1985 when President Muhammad Buhari was in power. This was how we saw this intolerance to people exercising their fundamental uh, human rights. And uh, the police have even overstepped their band by parading those who demonstrated in, uh, who participated in those uh, demonstrations. Uh, it has also been uh, alleged, and the mother of a girl has claimed that it was the police that killed her uh, uh, daughter. All these things are manifestations of what you call a fascist uh, government. In fact, this government is becoming more and more addicted to the blood of evils and to the blood of Yoruba and to the blood of those who criticize them. And it is incumbent on all Nigerians to stand up and say no to all these senseless killings and judicial killings that we are seeing all over the place. The world has grown, has, has grown this kind of gestapo manner of a managing government. You have uh, you got into government and uh, your performance has been uh, atrocious, uh, incompetent, uh, irresponsible, and then you know, Nigerian people are now crying, and you are now saying they should shut out their mouth, they should not uh, uh, cry. Where is that ever so? When the child is beaten, the child is expected to cry. But what the government is telling us today is that uh, we should not complain about their incompetence, <coughs> about their inability <coughs> to deliver the decision of um, the democracy. Uh, it is only in Nigeria that this kind of thing should be happening. I will sure stand up and say no to it. Okay. So, 
One of the key issues, you know, in the country right now still remains this farmers' headers clash. There's also the Yoruba Nation agitation and all the reaction um, to it by the state and the federal government. Now, 17 southern governors are set to meet in Lagos today in Alausa, hosted by Governor Babajide Sonwolu. What do you expect of that decision? And how would you assess the impact of the one they had in May? in Delta State. So can you repeat that again? I think we're getting Can you hear me, Mr. Kolawale? Yes, I'm hearing you now. I'm hearing you now. Okay. I was saying can that this question. Okay, I was saying that 17 southern governors are meeting in Lagos today in Alhausa to discuss issues that affect the southern part of the country. And, you know, recall that they had met on May 11th, you know, where they banned open grazing amongst other resolutions. So, so I'm saying, what are you expecting of these governors and what are your comments on maybe their synergy, you know, coming together to make decisions that affect their states? Oh, well, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's a very noble thing. It's uh, something that uh, is a long overdue. You will remember when um, uh, uh, Kivun Batwe was alive, he will usually discuss the kind of things, the kind of activities that the southern governors are doing now as a kind of a concordia or a shake uh, across uh, the Niger. Uh, it's probably, uh, this will probably be the second time yeah, we are seeing the southern governors uh, exercise this kind of solidarity, this kind of comradeship, this kind of uh, friendship. So we encourage them. I suspect that when they meet in Alausa, they might be reviewing the decision that they took when they first met, uh, I think, was it in Onisha or... Uh, in Delta. Uh, where they last? No, Delta, when they first met uh, in the Delta State. I suspect that they might also be reviewing the directive of Mr. President that the Attorney General of the Federation should uh, top up the defect and recover all the grazing routes that have been uh, encroached upon uh, all over the country. My worry is that uh, when they take these kind of decisions, they usually will not have the will, the political uh, will, the spine to really push through whatever decision that they have taken. So uh, because of their vested political ambition, also because most of them also, they have couples that are, they have um, wardrobes that are living with the skeletons and war apples. Otherwise, if not, immediately the president gave that kind of a directive. One would have expected a wholesale reaction from some of these southern uh, governors. But to them, their personal ambition is more paramount to the welfare of their people. Yeah, it might just be another talk shop. You know, it might just be another talk shop. I don't see them having the political way to really be able to drive through uh, some of the things that, uh, or agenda that they have set uh, for themselves. Take, for example, the uh, kidnap of uh, Nambikanu and then uh, the horrendous attack on the home of a Sunday boy in the past. I haven't had any of the 17 governors speak. Uh, with regards uh, to that. And to me, that is more important because what those two people, what those two great Nigerians are doing is in a way the foundation uh, of what the governors uh, are now going to be discussing in their respective or in whatever meetings that they are holding. So for them to keep quiet on that kind of a thing doesn't uh, speak well uh, for us as a people. I mean, for them as uh, a governor's who really meant uh, business. Uh, Take also the Amateco team, they have started it. Uh, have they provided the necessary funds? Have they really allowed these people to do the work the way it should be done? They won't allow them to do the work because they are always afraid and scared of uh, annoying, of um, not being the good books of their other principles. All right. Um, the Daily Independent this morning, there's a story on. Um Bandits are uh, uh, abducting babies, and nurses, and security uh, guards at a uh, hospital in Zaria. Um, quickly share your thoughts on that one. Uh, it seems like it has gotten you know, to that level of desperation where even babies now are being kidnapped. What? You hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. 
Yeah. Well, you and I do know that uh, Kaduna State has become uh, the world capital of uh, kidnapping. Uh, this has been going on uh, almost on a daily basis. The stories of kidnapping no longer has the kind of effect or the kind of impact or gives the kind of feelings that the Nigerian people used to have when they hear that people are being kidnapped. We are almost reaching a state of anomaly. We are becoming numb uh, with regard to these activities. The truth of the matter is that the man in Kaduna State who calls himself the governor uh, is uh, good at uh, making noise and uh, designing blueprints that he never gets to effect. Uh, not too long ago, a few weeks ago, he now said he has a blueprint to stop kidnapping um, in Kaduna State. I remember he also said that once you don't pay bandits, once you don't pay ransom, banditry and kidnapping will subside or it will um, uh, be wiped away gradually. But that has not stopped. The truth of the matter is that the policies and programs that the government in Kaduna State has been um, um, uh, doing since the Rufai came to power uh, takes uh, people, take people's job uh, away from them. It also uh, takes uh, schooling uh, opportunities uh, from the children. People also lose their houses. Just uh, last or two is another. School fees was increased by 500 uh, percent. And the uh, students demonstrated, rather than uh, the government listening to their demonstrations and calling for dialogue and all that. And the security guards were uh, sent out, and then I think two students were killed um, in a cold blood. For God's sake, if it's somebody's children, somebody's son, if it's somebody's daughter, you are killing. And when the government goes out to kill other people's children and they uh, show the seed of sorrow, tears, and blood on the people, you are not led to expect the kind of uh, activities and reactions that we are getting uh, in the cartoon state. Because when people lose their jobs, not many people who want to be beggars, not many people who want to stay at home and die of what for, not many people who want um, uh, to die of salvation. They are likely to uh, uh, do things that the Lord does not permit, such as kidnapping and all that, to keep and uh, make a hands uh, meet. So the government of Kaduna State should um, uh, uh, keep, give people their jobs back. They should also let the children um, continue to pay the school fees that they are paying now because the money is not even there for any of these people to pay the 500% uh, increase. Furthermore, they should borrow the example of legal states with their security trust fund in which the government and the private businesses in legal states will put money down to provide uh, the necessary materials for the police and also encouragement in terms of extra allowance, in terms of insurance, in terms of uh, compensation when security people lose their job in the course of um, uh, their duty. We haven't seen much of this in Kaduna State and in the northern parts of the country. All the time, it's, uh, they, they take a boat to Abuja uh, to beg and they see that the government uh, at the center should foot all the peace of whatever is happening in their respective states. Uh, they are like Oliver Twist, who is never satisfied with whatever it gets at any particular period in time. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Serap and the federal government. We know about how they always, you know, sue the presidency over, you know, one issue or another, demanding, yeah. demanding transparency. So right now, Serap is suing President Muhammad Buhari over 25 billion uh, naira, billion billion dollars uh, overdraft taken from the CBN. That's yeah. on the daily independence as well. And they're basically saying that the federal government owes Nigeria that accountability and transparency and, uh, you know, invoking the Freedom of Information Act to demand that the presidency releases details of how they've basically spent about $25 billion that they've taken, uh, including as loans from the CBN. Um, no date has been fixed for this hearing yet, but how do you foresee this to go? Do you think the federal government will, you know, give Sarah what they want and the people what they want, the transparency, or do you think they will continue to slog this out in court? And also, how would you rate the president in terms of being open with their communication and, uh, you know, spending with the people? Well, uh, let me say that uh, the several people are showing good example 
you know at the beginning of this conversation I have said that uh, people have uh, two, three or four opportunities to express their opinion or grievances when government policies and programs um, struggling uh, to them. I say you could uh, go to court because we don't encourage you to embark on self help. You can do lobby, you can do mediation, you can do coordination, you can also do protest and all that. So when Senate goes to court, uh, it takes a long time before decisions are taken up before they get judgment. Uh, when Senate goes to court, sometimes or most times the government will not even obey court orders when these court orders are gotten. But you see, the Senate is really precedent for the rule of law for the future. So that when our children come, it will be seen that certain persons have one period in time, try it as much as possible to ensure that Nigeria does not do the part of anarchy, that we govern ourselves with the instrumentality of law, that we are a people, a society that respects their law. So whether Sarah gets a favorable decision in court and whether the government to base this decision or not, it's good that they still go to court. We are teaching ourselves that we are civilized people, that we should always at all period in time uh, engage government activities and programs using the instrumentality of, uh, of the law. Now, with the issue that they took to court, uh, you will recollect, not too long ago, the governor of those states said um, the people in authority were merely printing money and uh, spending it. And the government uh, initially denied it. But uh, somehow, uh, the CBN governor came out to say, look, it was money that they were borrowing the state to be able to meet the obligations and pay salaries. What is coming out now, the overdraft that they are talking about and all that, is the equivalent to money printing money and spending it. This is what is described as the way that means by government to finance its programs and all that. And so, ah, and the, the law does not permit that kind of a thing. If there is also the, the variation, in the bill that we took to the National Assembly, the uh, appropriation bill and which was uh, passed into law, you have to go back to the National Assembly and say, look, oh, the revenue that you're expecting from social so places and all that, we haven't gotten it. The taxes that we say we'll use to finance these government programs and all that are not common. We want to borrow money from the CPA. Uh, we, we want to use ways and means to finance government programs and activities. And then it is the National Assembly who will debate the merits and the merit of those things, and then uh, maybe pass um, uh, a bill to pack up the government or a new appropriation bill and other so that they be able to, to take over from the city. But this has not been done. So to that extent, it's um, a breach of the appropriation bill. In fact, it is an impeachable offense, in my humble opinion, because the appropriation law is a law that the executive of government is not expected to violate. Then let us also go back home. A government that is borrowing money from just anywhere it could borrow, from the international community, from uh, the local bank, from the CBN and other, it's also the government that has in the last uh, two or three weeks established about five or six universities or they are about. And also some other uh, organizations um, uh, when in reality you don't have money to finance those programs and to, 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 to to finance the establishment of those schools. You also will remember that as of today, as we expect me to again go on strike because all the agreement that they reach is government, that the present schools that we have on guard will be properly financed, they are not being met by government. So how can you be borrowing money to establish university schools and then and they pay salaries if it's never done? When monies are borrowed, such monies are supposed to be invested in projects that will be able to repay at the low. But that is not what we are saying uh, with this government. Furthermore, I have been emphasizing this. The cost of contracts in this part of the world is the highest, is one of the highest, if not the highest in the whole world. What efforts has this government made to review the cost of contracts in the country so that we can bring in down uh, uh, the monies and all that that we have spent all that is put up in uh, backing of some of these projects. Also look at the cost of, uh, of uh, governance, uh, the, the, the jumbo piece in the National Assembly, uh, the security votes that um, all the executive uh, arms of government and even the legislature 
and the local government level are taking. Why can't we resist some of these things and all that? Because invariably, these people don't deserve to get any or take any security for. They are not the commissioners of police or the DPO of the local police stations in their respective uh, 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 area. And uh, there are several series of other things and ways I mean by which governments can cut them and pull that with expenditure. Look at the war that we are fighting with the Pokwala. This right. war has Ms. been Ms. going Nicola on for the past 10 years. And Nigeria is still importing basic things like that and ammunition, AK-47, bombs and whatever. When the uh, landmines, when these are things that the Pokwala, the rat tag of Pokwala Mami are producing, Nigeria right. has Mr. Kola Wale, we would have to wrap up here uh, because of time. We'll have to wrap up here. Thank you very much uh, for your time this morning. We always enjoy kicking off our Monday mornings with you here on The Breakfast. Uh, so thank you for joining us this morning. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. All right. We wish you a beautiful it's week great. ahead. I been with you. All right. Stay with us. Uh, we're, of course, uh, going on a short break. When we come back, we're moving into yes. a little bit of history. I'm going back to the year 1975 to tell you a little bit about uh, tennis history. Mm. And I'm going back to the year 1946 to talk about, you know, a time in our history where, you know, women, the bodies of women began to, you know, be looked at through a different lens. We'll be right back.